Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. We're going to get started here with our second panel, uh, Finding Balance in Policy and Enforcement Tools to Control Opioid Access. We have just an incredible group of, of speakers today, and I, I think this will be a really engaging discussion. Uh, moderating our panel today is uh, Rebecca Cunningham, the Interim Vice President for Research at the University of Michigan. She's also the Principal Investigator and Director of uh, one of the 10 CDC-funded injury centers here at the University of Michigan. So welcome, Rebecca. So thank you, Dr. Brummett and IHPI and um, the University of Michigan broadly leadership for the support of this conference today. I'm just really honored to be here uh, directing uh, our Injury Prevention Center, which as Dr. Brummett mentioned, is one of the 10 injury prevention centers funded by the CDC in the country. We've been, our focus uh, has been long centered on this topic and partnering with many of the other centers on campus, including MOPEN and IHPI, uh, and working together along with building a broad opioid solutions a component across the University of Michigan. I, before we, I introduce the panel, I just want to say, in reflecting on the last panel, which I found so engaging, how much, although the depth of the problem is reflected with us, how much hope also that I have when I, when I hear the panelists speak and I think about, uh, yes, we have a long way to go in addressing problems, uh, stigma, uh, but I also think as an emergency physician how far we've come in the last 10 or 15 years with recognizing uh, the emergency department and other public health as really locations for contact, for integrating care across these chasms that we have, and that the lessons we'll learn uh, as we really embrace addressing this opioid epidemic together, challenges such as Dr. Simmer mentioned of episodic care and cliffs that our patients experience at different care points and the stigma that is associated with mental health as we address those challenges together across sectors is how we will address many of the other challenges that will follow uh, whatever the next crisis is that we face together beyond the opioid crisis. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists today. Uh, first, we have Craig Summers, who has a, been a colleague for many years in, in this battle with the opioid crisis, is the executive director of the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, or HIDA, here in Michigan. He was appointed the executive director of the Michigan HIDA in January of 2018 after serving as a deputy director since 2009. He began his law enforcement career with the Farmington Hills Police Department on the ground and served the city of Farmington Hills as a patrol officer, field training officer, detector, undercover officer with the Oakland County Narcotics Enforcement Team, NET, and the team leader with NET, patrol sergeant and patrol lieutenant. He was promoted to commander in charge of the patrol division in January 2001 and served as a member of the chief's executive staff until he retired in 2009. Then he was promoted to the assistant chief in 2004 and served to both the administrative bureau and the investigative bureau. He has a bachelor's degree from Wayne State University and a master's of science degree in the administration from Central Michigan University. He is a graduate of the 213th session of the FBI National Academy and the 132 session of the Northwestern University School of Police Staff and Command. Please welcome uh, Craig Summers. Not, not up yet, I'm gonna introduce all of you. I'll introduce all our panelists and then, and then they'll come up in, uh, in succession. Uh, uh, Barbara McQuaid is my honor uh, to introduce, is a professor at the University of Michigan Law School. Professor McQuaid teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and national security law at the University of Michigan. She's also a legal analyst for NBC News and MSNBC, uh, where I know I'm excited often to see her. From 2010 to 2017, Professor McQuaid served as a U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. She was appointed by President Barack Obama and was the first woman to serve in her position, uh, exciting again to so many of us. Professor McQuaid also served as the vice chair of the Attorney General's Advisory Committee and co-chaired the Terrorism and National Security Subcommittee. Before becoming U.S. Attorney, Professor McQuaid was an assistant U.S. Attorney in Detroit for 12 years on the ground, serving as Deputy Chief of the National Security Unit. Born in Detroit, Professor McQuaid is a 1987 graduate of the University of Michigan and a 1991 graduate of the University of Michigan Law School. Please we welcome Professor McQuaid. 
Dr. Meredith Rosenthal is the C. Boyd and Gray Professor of Health Economics and Policy at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and we welcome that partnership again today. She's the faculty chair of the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative. Dr. Rosenthal's research examines the design and impact of market-oriented health policy mechanisms with a particular focus on the use of financial incentives to alter consumer and provider behavior. Dr. Rosenthal is a member of the Massachusetts Center for Health Information and Analytics Oversight Commission and a board member for the Massachusetts Health Quality Partners. Dr. Rosenthal was elected to the Institute of Medicine, now the Academy of Medicine, in 2014 and received her PhD in health policy at the Harvard University in 1998. Please welcome Dr. Rosenthal. Last but certainly not least, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, a colleague and long member of our Injury Prevention Center and School of Public Health here, Dr. Hafiji, who is an assistant professor in the Health Management and Policy here at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Dr. Hafiji is a trained lawyer and health policy researcher, an assistant professor at HMP in our School of Public Health, is also the policy analyst activities lead of our policy work group in the outreach core of our Injury Prevention Center. Dr. Hafiji's research combines detailed legal analysis analysis with empirical investigations and the relationships between law and health. Uh, Dr. Hafiji substantively focuses her research on behavioral health and pharmaceutical policy areas evaluating policies such as mental health, substance use parity laws intended to address opioid addiction and misuse like prescription drug monitoring programs. She received her PhD, JD, and MPH from Harvard University. The connections between our universities are extensive and hopefully ongoing. Please welcome Dr. Hafiji. And now I'm honored to turn the stage over to Craig Summers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cunningham. I consider it an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, I speak for law enforcement. Uh, our partnership has been uh, with the University of Michigan and the University of Michigan Injury Center, the Center for Disease Control and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services for over three years now. It's a great partnership. It's a duty that we all work together. I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about what HIDA does. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the threat in the state of Michigan, tell you a couple of things that we see, and uh, I'm sure my eight minutes will be up. So, if you want to, oh, I have the, uh, here we go. HIDA, it's a federal grant program administered by the Office of National Drug Control Policy. So my boss is the federal drug czar. Uh, basically, we receive federal grant funds locally controlled in the state of Michigan, and um, our job is to disrupt and dismantle drug trafficking and money laundering organizations throughout the state of Michigan and throughout the country. Um, the way we do that is I run an intel center in Southfield, Michigan, uh, investigative support in intel. Uh, we bring all our law enforcement partners together, uh, federal, state, local, tribal, and for the last several years, education and public health to basically work on specific drug control issues in our region, the state of Michigan, and throughout the country. Like I said, the goal of our program is to disrupt and dismantle drug trafficking and money laundering organizations and to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our operations by using real-time data, sharing intelligence, sharing information. So I work for an executive board. Basically, they are the, the most important and influential uh, law enforcement leaders in the state of Michigan. Uh, Barbara uh, sat on my executive board for several years and she was actually the chairperson of the Michigan Haida executive board. Um, eight federal partners, all the big agencies, FBI, DEA, HSI, U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, ATF, Marshals, all sit on the board. State locals, Michigan State Police, Detroit Police Department, Sheriff's Departments, and basically they work at the 50,000 foot um, level to direct myself and my team and our task forces on what we're going to do. Uh, we do everything based on a threat assessment. Uh, we produce a threat assessment every year that's available to everybody. It's put together by analysts and it really describes the drug threat in the state of Michigan. In 2018, our teams alone, now this is not all law enforcement, these are just Michigan Haida teams investigated 224 drug trafficking organizations in the state of Michigan. These organizations, their sole purpose is to make money. These are not people with substance use disorder. These are not people, uh, street level people. These are drug trafficking organizations uh, 
from five to seven members starting neighborhood gangs, all the way up to major cartels taking us back into Mexico, Sinaloa, many of the other cartels that are actually doing business in the state of Michigan. 118 of those uh, DTOs, or 52% trafficked heroin, the ones we investigated last year. 101 trafficked cocaine, 41 trafficked prescription drugs, 13 trafficked fentanyl. This is going on every day in the state of Michigan. Uh, what my biggest message to the group that everybody I think needs to realize is that the cartels have one objective, one objective goalie, and that's to make money. They have no respect for human life, they're relentless, and long as there is a demand in the state, in the country, they are gonna find a way to supply it. So that's where we're at. They are motivated by money and nothing else. Last year, now these are just 28 uh, enforcement teams that we support throughout the state. DEA-led teams, FBI-led teams, HSI-led teams, MSP-led teams. This is what we seized just in the state of Michigan last year. 72 kilograms of heroin, 17 kilograms of fentanyl, 436 kilograms of cocaine, 312 of prescription drugs, methamphetamine, 51 kilograms. That's just what our team seized in the state of Michigan. So it kind of gives you a picture of how much is coming into the state and how much money is in the business of drug trafficking organizations. Here's one of the reasons we're here. And uh, this is where our partnership started with the University of Michigan and University of Michigan Injury Center. One of the things that we need, just like all researchers, all interventionists, public health, public safety leaders, we need real-time data to, to, to intervene. And on our end, my job and my team's job is to get the fentanyl and the heroin off the streets before somebody gets killed. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for those traffickers that are dealing the most poisonous chemicals, get them off the street before more people die. On the public health side, we're talking about prevention intervention. We're talking about treatment opportunities. And the data that we've been dealing with in the state of Michigan for years now is 16, 18 months old. And everybody knows that it's very, very hard to provide any kind of intervention, be it law enforcement or public health on old data. So we partnered with the University of Michigan uh, three years ago uh, to develop some systems to basically provide for public health and public safety real-time data regarding fatal and non-fatal drug overdoses. Dr. Rebecca Cullum and her team, Dr. Amy Bonnert, Amanda Kagowski, our PHA, have been working diligently to create and implement the system for overdose surveillance, opioid overdose surveillance. Basically, the system will in real time collect data from medical examiners, first responders, and emergency departments regarding fatal and non-fatal drug overdoses. Uh, reason being, for us to go out and intervene, we need the data in real time. They're working on that. They have been a huge help. We could not do it without their partnership. Uh, just to let you know, the Center for Disease Control and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services are also involved in getting these systems together and this data together. So, you have to understand that as long as there's money to be made, and there's a demand in the state, the cartels are gonna be here. We are not gonna be able to arrest our way out of this problem or the next problem that's coming. We are clearly not gonna be able to seize our way out of this problem, nor are we gonna be able to just treat our way out of this problem. Three things working together, we're doing much better, but I really feel that we need to get and do a better job on the prevention end. We need to do a much better job as a team utilizing your expertise and your knowledge to get a message out to our children not to get involved in illicit drugs. Because right now we're just keeping the lid on of what's going on. Um, so that's kind of what's happening with us. The one thing I do want to let you know is that the threat in the state of Michigan is much greater than just heroin and opioids. Methamphetamine and cocaine are coming into the state at the highest levels. We doubled our seizures for cocaine and methamphetamine last year. The cartels are going to continue to flood the market with those things. And I think you need to think about um, some of the cutting agents and the things that we are finding in the drugs that you maybe need to test for. We're finding now that a lot of the drugs that we are, are, are testing contain things like levomisol, phenactosin, 
diphedrahydrine, quinine, noscopine, and papaverine. I don't know what all those things do. I know, <laughs> I know a lot of them do bad things. Some of our anti-convulsants, anti-tussins, but they're killing people, and I think they're things you need to look for. I'd like to introduce my good friend, my partner, a leader in our community, and a true forward thinker, Barbara McQuay. Well, good morning, Craig. Thank you very much, and thanks for the important work that you do at, uh, at Haida. Chad, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. I think uh, this kind of conference is absolutely essential to addressing this problem because too often we have healthcare people working and medical people working and researchers working and law enforcement working in our own silos and not sharing the information that we need. And sharing information is so incredibly important. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how it affects us in law enforcement, and you'll see why it's so important that we collaborate together because um, for every enforcement policy we have, there's a consequence. And some of those consequences are just as intended and they're wonderful and it has just the public safety impact that we wanted. And then other times it has um, no, no impact whatsoever and, and it failed and we try something else. And then other times there are collateral unintended consequences that are negative and it's important that we be together and sharing information and that evidence and that data so that we can go back to the drawing board and come up with enforcement policies that actually work. Um, and I'll give you a great example of enforcement policies that work. How many of you have ever walked as a pedestrian on the streets of Ann Arbor? Right, many of us. And for our Harvard friends, our friends from Harvard, walk about as you visit Ann Arbor. But I'll tell you what I mean, um, a couple of years ago, um, you may recall that it used to be if you were standing in a crosswalk waiting to cross, cars would be flying by you. You would have your life in your hands as you wanted cars to stop. But the city of Ann Arbor had an ordinance on the books that said that if a pedestrian is in the crosswalk, cars must stop. And what they said is, we're gonna start enforcing this aggressively, 100% enforcement. Police cars were there, were giving tickets out left and right for anybody who blew through one of those pedestrian crosswalks. And now what happens if you stand in a crosswalk? Everybody stops. I noticed this last night as I was walking to Professor Schlissel's house for a reception he had for all of the speakers. I stopped in the crosswalk and er, all the cars stopped. I took my time. I walked, I walked across, gave him a little thank you wave. And I thought that is a great example of law enforcement working and getting the consequences that were intended. But so often we have collateral unintended consequences that we have to take that data and use it to make sure we're informing all of our enforcement policies to have the consequences that we intend. There are, we call them, you know, levers. And so you talked about what Craig does at the Haida. And what law enforcement does best is not just jumping out of a car uh, and reacting to crime on the street corner, arresting people who are selling drugs hand to hand. Law enforcement works best when it comes up with a strategy. It uses intelligence and data and research and information to attack problems, to not just be uh, processors of cases, but community problem solvers. And when you use the law, it pushes levers. It has impact and influence on behavior. And so we need to think thoughtfully about the kinds of crimes we're gonna prioritize for enforcement, the kinds of penalties that are gonna be available to provide incentives and disincentives for certain kinds of behavior. And we need to consider those things when we do it. And so law enforcement works best when we're thinking about the supply side. I know Craig made a, a pitch to uh, addressing the demand side, and so much of your work is on that side. And there's some great um, work that's being done. I know I sit on the board of the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan that's working on the Michigan Opioid Partnership to address the demand side of this problem. But on the supply side, there are certain drivers like overprescribing, Medicare fraud, compliance issues, and distributors who are motivated by greed that are driving this oversupply of opioids. And when we have changes in the law, we can impact um, the outcome on those things. So we had some changes in the law just in the past year, some things on the books about requiring bona fide doctor-patient 
relationships before a doctor can prescribe opioids, for example. We have a new law on the books that a doctor may not prescribe more than a seven-day supply of opioids to patients. And those are very good things. It can provide accountability for doctors. It can prevent people from getting an over uh, supply of opioids. I know I had a son a few years ago who broke his ankle at the age of 12 and was given a 30-day supply of hydrocodone to deal with his broken ankle. Um, only because I was a pretty informed consumer did I choose not to fill that prescription, but how many other parents out there would do what the doctor said and give that 12-year-old 30 days of hydrocodone? Um, so those are all good things, but they also have consequences. If a patient can't get opioids from his doctor that he truly needs for pain or um, is getting an addiction, they're going to go elsewhere. And so we need to think about the consequences of those changes in the law. I think it's too soon to say whether this is a good idea or a bad idea in Michigan, but I can tell you it does have consequences. And one of them is driving people from their primary care physician with whom they do have that relationship, a doctor who is looking out for their best interest, and driving them to pill mills. And this is a huge problem in Michigan and in many communities in our country, this idea of uh, doctors who are using pills as the kickback in exchange for Medicare fraud. And we've had these pill mills all over our community, one right here in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, there was a pill mill taken down that made over $4 million in Medicare fraud uh, by distributing more than a million pills. And the way these work, if you look at the data, you know, it's not the doctors in this audience who are driving the opioid crisis in our community. It is a very small subset of doctors who are also engaged in Medicare fraud, who are the ones who are prescribing the highest quantities of opioids. And the way the scheme works is you set up shop. There are patient recruiters who will go out and bring people in. They'll go to rehab facilities. They'll go to uh, homeless shelters. They'll go to soup kitchens. They'll go wherever they need to go and ask people if they're interested in some pills. People come in an exchange for their prescription. They either undergo unnecessary procedures or sign documents saying that they underwent procedures when they didn't go undergo any at all. The doctor then sends that off to Medicare for reimbursement to the tune of thousands and thousands of dollars. The patient has his prescription and goes on his way and comes back for more and more, and the doctor continues to make a lot of money. Um, Medicare fraud is estimated to cost taxpayers $50 billion a year, and it is also flooding our streets with opioids. And why are people turning to pill mills? I think in part because they're not getting it from their primary care physician. And so we will continue to crack down on pill mills, um, but that also has an unintended consequence. You heard Craig talk about the damage we're seeing now with fentanyl and carfentanyl. So if you can't get your pills because law enforcement's doing such a good job of cracking down on the pill mills, where do they go next? They go to heroin on the streets. Um, and heroin, of course, is often laced with fentanyl. And that's where we see, I think, so many of these overdose deaths. We saw an interesting statistic earlier today from Dr. Caldoun, which showed that uh, overdose deaths from opioids pills is going down in Michigan, but overdose deaths from heroin is going up. And I can't help but feel maybe uh, some pangs of guilt that it isn't a consequence of the good work that we're doing to shut down pill mills that's driving people to instead look to heroin. And so every enforcement strategy that we use brings with it a consequence. And then the final thing that we're seeing um, now is a very aggressive use by doctors, uh, by law enforcement, to go after distributors of drugs. We just saw um, a takedown of a, a drug distributor, the Rochester Cooperative. There was a trial and convictions just last week against Insys, Insys uh, Therapeutics. And of course, a civil lawsuit against Purdue Pharmaceuticals and the Sackler family for $270 million. And all of those, I think we, we see um, a good in holding these corporate entities accountable. But again, I think we have to think about what is the consequence of that? Does it mean that it will push uh, pharmaceutical companies to conduct research to find other methods and other kinds of drugs that are safer for uh, our patients? Um, or does that just push them out of the market and leave opioids no longer available for us 
um, and for the healthcare community to prescribe to patients. And so as we think about the kinds of strategies we wanna use, we really need your wisdom, your data, your evidence to help us in law enforcement to make sure that we're not having the collateral consequences of driving patients to heroin and fentanyl, and instead, we're using the kinds of strategies that make cars stop when we're standing in the crosswalk. Thanks very much, and um, I will now turn it over to my next presenter, uh, Dr. Meredith Rosenthal. Nobody warned me that Professor McQuaid was gonna be such a tough act to follow. <laughs> I would have asked for a shuffle. Uh, thank you everyone, and I wanna thank the organizers. It's really such a pleasure to be able to join you here with a, a really wonderful audience, and I'm, I'm so impressed with the level of the conversation so far. I'm going to take us a bit upstream and talk about the role of pharmaceutical promotion of opioids in this crisis. And b before I begin, I do want to disclose that I am an expert witness uh, that has been retained by plaintiffs in some of the opioid litigation that's ongoing. <laughs> Pharmaceutical marketing, as you all know, uh, if you ever turn on your television, uh, try to go to the New England Journal of Medicine to find an excellent article I'm going to tell you about today, or, or really do virtually anything in public life, uh, is ubiquitous. And so the schema that I have up here is, uh, gives you some sense of the way I think about pharmaceutical marketing and its influences on physicians. Um, of course, marketing happens direct to physicians through face-to-face -face visits from detailers, through sponsorship of meetings and events, uh, but it also happens to a large degree indirectly. Patients, for example, in some cases are targeted. Um, in the case of opioids, there are patient-facing materials that have been disseminated, uh, and those materials come back to physicians in the form of conversations with their patients. Uh, moreover, we've seen in the case of opioids and in many other, for many other product classes, that the industry targets certain professional and consumer groups with support uh, and information that they, in turn, can disseminate. I think we heard earlier um, the Rear Admiral mention the role of the Joint Commission and specific guidelines that were disseminated by the Joint Commission. Other medical guidelines, of course, uh, also received a certain amount of sponsorship from opioid manufacturers. And then those guidelines, even if the amount of money that goes to the guideline disseminating organizations is relatively modest, those guidelines then become a legitimizing basis for detailing. And so we should think about this ecosystem as being extremely intertwined and those, um, those different strategies having multiplier effects across them. While uh, direct-to-consumer advertising in, of prescription drugs has grown more rapidly after the, over the past several decades um, and has garnered a lot more concern, particularly among clinicians, but also among public health professionals, marketing to professionals remains the dominant form of pharmaceutical marketing. You can see in this bar chart, which shows data uh, from a 2019 article by uh, the late Lisa Schwartz and Steve Wollishen, uh, that medical marketing in the U.S. Uh, uh, targeting physicians consumes about $20 billion in the present. Um, that number hasn't changed that much in real dollars since 1997, uh, but we do see some really important shifts in terms of uh, the use of free samples, uh, and, and physician marketing really is at the heart of many of these other techniques. In 2013, as many of you know, the Physicians Payment uh, Sunshine Act required pharmaceutical and device manufacturers to disclose certain transfers of value to physicians. These are available on a public website that you can search by physician, by company. Uh, and um, some researchers led by uh, Hadland et al. published a study looking at 
tr these transfers of value to physicians regarding opioid products. And you see here uh, the dominant way in which uh, companies use their funding to influence prescribers outside of detailing um, was through speaking fees and honoraria. And so that gets back to my ecosystem. You may be in an office where you refuse to see detailers, but if the key opinion leaders in your hospital, in your community, are being targeted by companies, the, that effect will eventually trickle down through peer networks. Um, so while these payments uh, relative to the size of ph pharmaceutical marketing budgets are modest overall, they may have a really outsized effect. I'd also like to discuss just very briefly uh, what we have in terms of a regulatory framework around pharmaceutical marketing. I, I would say it's, it would be accurate to describe the regulation of pharmaceutical marketing as a very light touch uh, set of rules and enforcement mechanisms. Uh, and we often rely on industry to self-regulate. The Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association have various guidelines uh, about their marketing efforts. Um, if you look at this chart, which comes again from the Schwartz and Wallison paper, uh, it shows uh, on the left axis uh, the letters from the FDA going out to pharmaceutical manufacturers uh, that find fault with the messaging in a particular um, marketing uh, campaign. And in the blue, the right-hand axis is the number of uh, the number of promotional pieces that were submitted to the FDA. Of course, that's increasing over time, and yet the warning letters are declining to extremely low levels. In other research, um, scholars have identified just an extremely low level of investment by the FDA in the Office of uh, Pre Prescription Drug Promotion to monitor these kinds of marketing efforts. You can see here there's a little blip in the black line where the FDA released uh, a new program called the Bad Ad Program that was intended to empower consumers and physicians to identify misleading marketing materials. Um, and that had a, a very temporary effect. I, I would, if you think about self-regulation of the industry as the fox watching the hen house, this looks to me, it's a bit like giving the hens some night vision goggles uh, to briefly uh, protect themselves. Clearly it's not sufficient. Uh, so um, just uh, to think a little bit more about what effects pharmaceutical marketing has had on opioid prescriptions in particular. Well, of course, um, the first place to start is we understand that uh, physicians are intended uh, to sort through the information they get, both from commercial and scientific sources, and, and make the best decisions on the part of their patients. And, and I have no, no doubt that, the, of course, the vast majority, with some few exceptions, do exactly that. Uh, but studies have shown that despite the fact that physicians deny that they rely on commercial sources of information, their beliefs about the risks and benefits of pharmaceuticals are often much more consistent with those messages than they are with published scientific results. Uh, and this should not be surprising. Um, marketing is effective. Uh, we know that from other parts of our lives. I don't know why we should expect physicians to be any different in terms of uh, the effect of marketing on, on them as well. Um, so it's really been proven in many instances that physicians can be misled by marketing. And uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers recognize that, uh, that marketing is effective, including off-label marketing. Off-label marketing has been a lucrative strategy for many years, and um, uh, the billions of dollars in, uh, in settlements and, uh, and fines that have come through from off-label marketing cases give testimony uh, to the willingness of industry to continue this practice. Uh, so the published literature, the science is very clear that promotion causes sales. Uh, we saw op opioid prescribing from the middle 1990s to the peak of opioid prescribing increase about five-fold in terms of um, mor uh, morphine equivalent per day. Uh, and, um, and I think you know, we also have seen in, in published documents in the litigation that was mentioned earlier uh, that the strategies of the industry were very widespread in terms of diminishing the messages about the possibility of addiction and also essentially describing addiction as a problem with certain individuals and not with opioids themselves. 
so as a, an, an article, an excellent article in the New England Journal of Medicine that was published this week pointed out, the opioid epidemic is ultimately an iatrogenic crisis. Um, it's really a triumph of marketing as well. And so while I, I think we should continue to discuss the importance of primary and secondary prevention, treatment, recovery, I think we should also step back and try to understand what we've learned about what it means for us to essentially, uh, for public health in particular, to allow a for-profit industry to shape treatment norms, um, not only for opioids, but for other treatments. I, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And it is my great pleasure to hand off the podium to our last speaker, Rebecca Hafiji, one of our wonderful students from Harvard, and you are all lucky to have her. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rosenthal and all the uh, esteemed speakers. Um, it's really wonderful to speak with you all. I have strong connections to both Michigan and Harvard now, um, and so it's, this is a treat. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, government policies that target opioid prescribing, and by that I should say opioid analgesic prescribing. I am not talking about um, medication-assisted treatment therapies, many of which are uh, uh, opioids themselves. Um, so. Let's see, let me make sure I can, there we go. Uh, so I think, and, and there's been great precursors to what I'm gonna discuss, uh, so that makes my job a little bit easier today. Um, we have had some sense now that opioid prescriptions have come down, um, not, and, and that's been uh, you know, concurrent with and actually preceded a little bit uh, the d decreases, dec declines in prescription opioid-related overdose deaths uh, in this country as well. Um, it's been at different times in different states. In Michigan, for example, it happened a little later than it did nationally um, because I think we were a little slower to implement some of the policies that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, but nationally, we really hit a peak around 2012 uh, and since then, we've come down, uh, depending on what metric you use, around 50%. Um, so there was just an IQVIA report that came out the other day that showed that even just from 2017 to 2018, uh, prescriptions came down, opioid prescriptions came down about 18%. Um, so in the peak, we were prescribing about um, over 259 million opioid prescriptions um, in 2012. Uh, by DEA data, it looked like it was actually a little bit more. Um, and that would have been enough for sort of every American to have their own bottle of, of prescription opioids in that year. Uh, so we've come down substantially, but um, I think it's important to remember we still are you know, high relative to um, some other markers. So on um, the right-hand side, you can see where we um, match up to other European countries. Um, and so our volume is still quite high. That was you know, a few years ago. Um, in 2015, we were about four times the consumption in US as compared to Europe. Um, so it begs the question of you know, still, at, you know, certainly at the peak, but maybe even even now still, sort of why, do we, why are we using opioids so much to treat pain um, when many of our conditions and underlying you know, need for those medications might not be that different from some of these other countries? Sorry. Um, so as a result, states, and so this is something I study quite a bit, is state opioid policy making. Uh, and I view, um, you know, we've had a lot of policy, and we've heard about some of the federal policy. I've actually really viewed the states at the forefront here uh, in the policy making. Um, they've been extremely busy. Uh, so from 2010 to 2016, uh, we had about 1,300 bills that were introduced. We had another 1,300 if you look at the time frame, just from 2015 to 17. So it's actually increasing in, um, in uh, fervor, um, it, but in that 2010 to 16 time frame, we had about, of those 1,300 bills, 500 or so enacted uh, at the state level. Over 50% of those uh, targeted prescription opioids in some kind of a way. So they were all opioid related, but a lot of them focused on the prescribing of opioid analgesics uh, in one way or another. Many focused on education, uh, PDMPs or prescription drug monitoring programs I'll talk about in further detail, uh, but those are really a dominant state response over 20% of these uh, bills uh, de dealt with those programs. We had a lot of activity in the prescription limits, uh, which we'll also talk about. Um, about 10% almost of bills were in that area. Um, there were other things around take backs and opioid exchange, so trying to get those prescription opioids that were in people's medicine cabinets uh, back uh, and safely disposed of. Um, the pain clinic regulations that you heard of from, uh, from Dr. McQuaid uh, were you know, another um, uh, reasonably prevalent uh, 
policy as well. So you know, we have um, not only were states enacting all these laws, and so we had you know all, all, virtually all states having a prescription drug monitoring program, 33 states having these prescription drug limits by the end of last year, uh, 11 states having pain, pain clinic laws. So lots of uh, flurry of activity, uh, but also they were not just implementing these laws, but making them stronger. So this shows you uh, prescription drug monitoring programs. So I'll take a minute to talk about these. These are electronic databases uh, that digitally store, monitor, and uh, analyze controlled substance dispensing information. Uh, we've really seen uh, an evolution in these programs. And when I first started studying them in 2010, I wasn't quite sure if they were going to um, catch on and, and become popular. Uh, many prescribers weren't even using them at the time. But they've really been latched onto by states as a, as a dominant uh, response to the opioid crisis and, a, and a solution. Uh, and so we've seen now um, all, all, all states have some form. Missouri doesn't have a statewide uh, database. They have a more local one, and they're considering a statewide one for the seventh time uh, this legislative session. Uh, but all other states have a statewide database, and these often communicate with each other. They have monitored more and more drug controlled substances over time. Uh, and also, this, this graph shows you, if you can uh, read some of those, but the, the features of these programs. So things like um, requirements that prescribe have to check the databases, requirements that they have to register with the systems, requirements that, or uh, the ability to use delegates to actually do the checking to make it a little bit more uh, user friendly, um, interstate sharing of data, as I mentioned. So all of these features have tremendously um, increased over time. Uh, so you can see that states are, are really latching onto this policy option um, and using them. And these, you know, most, in my view, the, these programs have evolved to be more patient care tools, but we have to remember they also are law enforcement tools. So there's this tension, and this is you know, what's creating a lot of controversy around these programs of late, uh, is you know, are we using these to better patient care and to uh, allow prescribers to identify, to see all the controlled substances a patient has, and, um, and identify polypharmacy, doctor shopping, uh, diversion, um, and just uh, you know, high levels of, of um, dose, dosing and things like that, um, or are we, are we using them as law enforcement tools to um, try to track those prescribers and those patients that might be high utilizers and go after those people. Um, you know, and I think you know, there's, there's that tension and you know, they can be used in some ways for both, but we have to be really careful about that balance. Also, policies that limit opioid prescriptions have been another uh, big um, uh, popular policy, both at the state level, but really these piggybacked off of um, the CDC guidelines that came out in 2016. Uh, many of you are familiar with their, these. These have, again, been quite controversial. Um, they were recommended. They were not required, uh, but uh, talked about things like dosing, not recommended above 90 morphine milligram equivalents per day, uh, that there should be other therapies tried before uh, turning to opioids in treating um, pain those sorts of things. Um, and the CDC has just come out and clarified uh, a lot of those um, uh, confusions uh, that have arisen from them. But uh, a lot of states uh, did uh, piggyback off of that and then enact these uh, limits. So day, day supplied limits, morphine milligram equivalent limits, uh, and those are laws. Uh, so, and Michigan has one, as we heard, of seven day limits uh, for acute prescribing. A lot of this uh, came from evidence that, you know, if we uh, prescribe, a Dowell study said, found that if we prescribe daily dosages at 50 milligrams equivalent or um, 100 milligram equivalents daily, that those vastly increase your risk of overdose. Um, we also have uh, this, this graph on the side shows you, on the, on the left-hand side shows you that, um, you know, if you have, if you're getting a lot of opio, uh, getting more days supplied opioids, your probability of having long-term use um, vastly increases as well. So that's where those day limits come from. There's been a lot of critique of these laws, however, that they're blunt instruments uh, and that they might not, they may be appropriate for one patient, but not another necessarily. So kind of looking at all of the evidence, um, and we've I've done a, a, a review of all of these policies, um, suggests that a number of them are having a, an impact on reducing prescribing, opioid analgesic prescribing, and including that which is high risk. And by that I mean high dosages, polypharmacy, doctor shopping, um, some of these things that we know increase your risk of overdose. Um, so these things include the strong prescription drug buying programs, especially paired with pain clinic laws, the CDC guidelines, um, and OxyContin uh, reformulation that may 
made that drug um, abuse deterrent. Um, some Medicare and Medicaid uh, restrictions, particularly prior authorization, uh, limits, and lock-ins. Uh, so all of those have in, have in different evidence show, been shown to reduce this opioid prescribing. But the question really is now in this red uh, kind of stop sign uh, 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 graphic, what is this? You know, what unintended consequences are these having? And unfortunately, we don't have great evidence here yet. Most of what we have is anecdotal, uh, but there are concerns that some of these things might be increasing overdose, um, particularly among with illicit opioids, uh, increasing self harm and suicide risk, um, reducing access uh, to needed opioids for many patients with chronic pain. Um, that they might not address the current crisis. That we, you know, really are. We, we have this heavy emphasis, as you saw, on prescribing, but we need other policies now to address a lot of the harms we're seeing, uh, and they really don't get to a lot of what we heard of, the, of these structural determinants. Um, so, you know, I think my general thought is, you know, the, we've made a lot of progress in this front, um, but we need to also turn to other policies and really now be studying and generating more evidence on some of these unintended consequences. Thank you very much. <laughs> My life here, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much to the fabulous uh, discussion and, and kickoff here by the panel. And so I'll start us off with a few questions. And then uh, a reminder again, if you have questions from the audience, to text it to the uh, number there on the screen. Um, so perhaps we could start off. There's so many places to go here, but some of the questions that come to mind that I can think about are, um, you know, thinking about what was presented, Dr. Rosenthal, specifically, perhaps I'll address this to you, in terms of the, the pharmaceutical components. So do we need a different regulatory regime for pharmaceutical promotion, or do we just need better enforcement? What's our path out here? Yeah, it's a, a really good question, and um, and one that I've struggled with. Uh, in addition to the work that I've done here, I've worked on direct-to-consumer advertising, and for a long time there was a call to ban direct-to-consumer advertising on the notion that it was inappropriate, essentially, for the industry to be communicating with the public without um, the intervene intervention, essentially, of the, of the clinicians involved. And and I have to say that uh, the more I have looked at situations like this one, it strikes me that the much bigger worry is professional marketing and the targeting of individual physicians and the health systems. Um, so even if you imagine stepping up the number of people at FDA who are responsible for enforcing those marketing regulations, are you going to have someone follow the detailer into every office? Um, so the materials themselves uh, are they're just really not sufficient to be able to assure us that what goes on in those conversations is balanced and complete. Uh, I, I do wonder if it's really time to think about uh, changing the way we regulate pharmaceutical marketing, particularly when it comes to face-to-face -face interactions between industry and prescribers in particular. Uh, this obviously is not a, a, there's not necessarily a lot of appetite for that kind of regulation. T to me, that is actually much more important than um, worrying about the direct-to-consumer advertising, even though it, it feels um, sort of like an intrusion it's right in front of you, um, and seeing what its limits are is very easy versus what goes on behind clo closed doors, I think, might require a totally new approach. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah. Um, a couple more thoughts. There's uh, so much interesting um, working in my head listening to these excellent presentations. So. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Hafiji, outside of the realm of opioid analgesic prescribing that you started to touch on, so what should we be prioritizing next? What should the governments be prioritizing next to address the opioid crisis? Yeah. Um, Thank you for the question. Um, I th I, I, yeah, I really do think, and, and Michigan is one place I think that recognizes we've done a lot on the prescribing front, and now we need to move to some other policies as well. Um, so first and foremost is the treatment um, and using evidence-based medications, making them more, more robustly available. We've heard some of that uh, earlier this morning, um, but I, I focus a lot on um, making sure that the treatment is evidence-based and then the workforce uh, shortage issues. So, um, you know, not 
just maybe, and I recommended in a context eliminating the waiver for buprenorphine prescribing, but that's not going to get us where we need to be. We need to also be incentivizing prescribers to actually want to enter this space and things like studied barriers. They need to have peer-to-peer -peer support. They need to have support from their institutional employers. They need to feel like they ha have, an, and not just other clinician support, but social worker um, and other types of support so that they can actually fully treat um, this patient uh, and want to do that. Um, I think naloxone access, we need you know, more, even more robustly provided and more money for that. Um, and laws there, there's been just a study that came out that suggested that, that not all laws are created equal there either. So um, those that allow pharmacists to actually um, ac d dispense and give prescriptions and give them more uh, power to do that are more effective, it seemed to be more effective at reducing overdoses than others. Um, I'd like to see more social supports on housing, employment, particularly for people in recovery, um, and more focus on the, fo and more money into the foster care systems where those systems are being totally depleted um, and don't have the resources to be um, helping the you know, number of the volume of, of children coming into there. Um, and finally, uh, we've also seen really big increases in um, infectious diseases. That hasn't been um, mentioned as much to, uh, this morning in hepatitis um, and uh, also HIV. Uh, and so we need to um, be tracking that and thinking about not, in my mind, not just uh, syringe exchange programs, but also supervised injection facilities and finding a way to do harm reduction and make uh, that act, those activities safer and actually use those as opportunities to get people into treatment um, and to f make them feel supported. And there are examples like Seattle is a, a city that's been doing some really great work on that front. Yeah, you know, as a non-medical person too, I. I can't help but wonder when, when we go out and you know, enforce laws, the, um, the huge demand there is for opioids and heroin. And I, I can't help but wonder if we shouldn't be focusing more, and I'm sure some of you are, you know, way, way upstream. Um, what is driving the demand? Why is it that so many people want to use opioids? Uh, some of it obviously is for chronic pain and we have lowered our tolerance for pain mm -hmm. institutionally and individually, I think. No, nobody wants to tolerate even a little bit of pain and no doubt there's real pain there. But I also think that there, you know, if you look at who's using opioids or abusing opioids, so often it's people in rural communities. Uh, I doubt that the pain is any greater there than it is elsewhere. So what's, what's driving the demand? And I, I think we, we heard about it earlier, some of it is you know, self-medicating. Uh, unaddressed mental health issues. Suicide is way up as well. So what's driving that? Is it people who are feeling left behind in the tech economy? And so I, I think focusing on why people are turning to opioids in the first place might help us, uh, you know, not have to do as much that, you know, in, invest the many millions of dollars we do on breaking up traffickers if we didn't have the market in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great lead into one of the next questions that thinking about, I know we're focused on, on opioids today, most certainly, but uh, Craig, in hearing your presentation, so you mentioned your, your recent threat assessments that come out of Michigan uh, regularly. And so, you know, we're going to continue to focus on the opioid epidemic, but uh, what is the next component of drug threat that you see coming, coming through that, and perhaps we can apply many of the things that we learned from this epidemic to that next threat coming down the pike? Well, I think the two things, uh, big things are methamphetamine, ice, uh, made by the cartels, uh, trafficked up into the state now, and then cocaine. The uh, amount of seizures that we had last year doubled in the effect. Um, to a certain extent, there's a little bit less of a demand for heroin. New people utilizing or experimenting with drugs have stepped away from maybe using heroin or opioids uh, because of all the great work everybody's doing, but there's still an appetite for illicit drugs and uh, people believe that both cocaine and methamphetamine are safer, uh, less hazardous to your health. We know that's not the case. Um, we know the addictive properties of methamphetamine are huge. And then the big thing that we haven't really taken into consideration are the cutting agents or the mix that the drug trafficking organizations and cartels are putting in these substances now. Back in my day when I was running a drug team, they basically cut the drugs with sugar-based products, uh, mannitol, inositol, um, baby formula, things like that. 
Now they're cutting these drugs with some of the things that I talked about in putting them in there. And for our, our, our medical practitioners in here, you're going to have people that are exhibiting symptoms that have nothing to do with the cocaine or the methamphetamine, but these anti-worming drugs or these anti-tussins or these anti-convulsants or these other things that they're mixing in there to, because they're cheap. So I think those are the concerns going forward. Yeah, it's interesting. It makes me think everything's cyclical. I think I started my career focusing on cocaine and patients in the emergency department and uh, thinking about um, mental health and stigma of those patients. And, and here we are again and, and a, a different drug, but perhaps things cycle back and, and we can learn as we move along. Um, I think I have one more question here and then we can maybe start to take questions from the audience as well. Um, so, you know, um, uh, Barbara, we, we talked a little bit about adverse collateral consequences, but so how do we, how do we avoid these adverse collateral consequences um, that, that we see and that Dr. Hafiji talked about some with policies as well in relation to the enforcement of the opioid laws? Yeah, I think it's really essential that we be talking to each other. I mean, conferences like this are wonderful, but the kind of collaboration that Haida has, for example, with, with research is so important that we're thinking these through, you know, not just um, looking at arrest success, but actually solving the problem and looking at reductions in overdose deaths or uh, reductions in abuse or reductions in uh, the amount of substances that are on the market. Um, and in, in addition to talking with others, you know, in the medical profession, in healthcare and policy, um, also talking to community members. I think Dr. Khaldun talked about that, talking with the people who are actually in the community, who are um, the patients who are uh, driving the abuse and the addiction, um, understanding their needs and understanding their situations so that um, when we create what we think is a good solution, we're not causing another problem. So one last thought, actually, I was last was not my last thought. And for um, for Dr. Rosenthal, you know, as you're talking about uh, the pharmaceutical promotion and how we've wound up in the public health quagmire that we are now, um, one can't help to think a little bit about history and uh, a tobacco industry and marketing and the quagmire that that led us to before. And, you know, before we move on to audience questions, are there things that we really can think about the parallels for this or the parallels that helped us move away from that that could help us here, help us understand? Sure, yes, and I, I can't help but think, uh, listening to Professor ha Hafiji and, um, and uh, McQuaid, that it is so much harder to get out of a situation like the one we're in than it is, I think, potentially to prevent it upstream uh, because you can't just put the horse back in the barn. A and uh, so the analogy to tobacco has been made quite a bit, particularly in the context of the multi-district litigation that's going on now, uh, with the hopes that a master settlement, uh, that certainly the judge in Ohio um, has expressed his aspirations that a master settlement might be reached that would allow for for the funding of treatment and uh, recovery supports and all of those uh, kinds of issues. Uh, well, I think there's a, a certain amount that we can learn from tobacco, uh, the ability to really shine light on uh, what were the marketing messages that were so effective and what was the industry's role. Uh, I, I think the current situation, of course, is a lot more complicated uh, because uh, simply putting money into uh, prevention, uh, which is that's a, not quite an accurate summary of what happened in the tobacco settlement, uh, but the s stakeholder groups here are just so much uh, more complicated mm -hmm. because of the role of illicit drugs that really hit piggybacked on the licit epidemic, uh, th that creates uh, additional challenges. I, I would say uh, that transparency and uh, better regulation, to me, that seems to be the common theme of what we might have learned from the tobacco epidemic, uh, what we might have learned from previous off-label marketing campaigns. Again, n none of this is new. Right. Uh, th the history is pretty well understood, and yet we have a very understandable tension uh, between sort of wanting to allow private industry to operate in ways that create innovation and benefits to the population, uh, but also recognizing that this is not a, a market that functions in the way that other markets do. We have these information problems. We are, we are going to get ourselves into situations like this unless we do a better job. 
So I think we can open it up now to audience questions. We've had several questions about long-term MAT, and we're wondering if there is research into how to safely move individuals off of MAT and into abstinence-based recovery. <laughs> so uh, we, we could perhaps touch on that here. I, I think a panel later in the afternoon might be focusing a little bit more on MAT specifically, um, and this is a little bit more on the policy and law enforcement component. So, I, I mean, I would say kind of briefly offhand, I, I think um, we have a lot to learn there still, but I, I'll leave it to Dr. Bonhart and some others in the afternoon to really fully answer that question unless somebody wants to tackle it here. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we, we, the evidence is really still evolving in the medication-assisted treatment space. Um, to my reading of the evidence, there is great support for yeah, the, some of the short-term uh, benefits of the medications. Um, we think that the counseling is a, an important add-on, but the evidence actually isn't, in, to my reading, not quite uh, supporting that yet. Um, so basically, the, you know, most are saying, if you're going to offer anything, offer the medications. Um, and there definitely is very good evidence that that increases retention in treatment, um, that that actually improves, reduces overdoses, reduces repeat overdoses um, for all three medications actually at this point, um, the naltrexone, the uh, buprenorphine, and methadone. Um, I think we don't have as much longitudinal data um, there, and so some of that is going to have to come from over time um, and how, you know, but we do know that this is not a short-term prospect. It's not a, oh, you'll be on these medications for a couple of um, months. It's going to be a year longer, chronic, um, and what's been really effective has been, um, there's been great evidence around some of these hub-and-spoke models uh, whereby we do, you know, a more intensive treatment um, in a treatment facility, opioid treatment program first and then refer out to the outpatient uh, setting. And so in some states, like so, um, in some places in New England, there's been very successful. Uh, so really making sure we have um, those types of models set up uh, so we can do this stepwise treatment, sort of intensive, then to outpatient, and then ultimately uh, to, you know, potentially being off medications. But for some people, I think it will be the case that they may need to be on those maintenance medications for the rest of their lives. I, I, and I think I, I would add to that just that um, although there is likely more information needed as we learn about people being on those medications for a long time, I think there's little doubt that they're still the right answer for now um, and are our best, most immediate action for this current crisis. And there's a lot of chronic diseases where we don't, we're, we're perfectly okay with people being on the rest of lifelong therapy if that's what they need to get through the rest of their life successfully as happy, productive members. And so thinking about what the stigma is around that question that's asked is something else. I don't have stigma for people who are on thyroid or insulin medication every day for the rest of their life. That's what they need for their chronic disease. So while we need to keep studying it, I think we also need to think about what the underlying stigma is of the question when it's asked. We've received a lot of questions around marijuana policy. Does any research exist that demonstrates the correlation between marijuana policy, both recreational and medical, and opioid use? Rebecca. I can take that yeah. one. I think that's you. Um, <laughs> so, so thus far, there have been a number of um, study is more ecological in design, um, and by that I mean they're looking at, you know, marijuana laws, uh, mostly medical laws, but there's been at least one study out of Colorado of the recreational laws, and comparing that to overdose, um, and you typically deaths. Uh, and so one of the challenges with, with marijuana is we, we can't actually, we don't have good tracking of use. Uh, it's not part of our medical system, so um, some of the prescription drug mining programs are starting to track um, marijuana sales as well, so that's helpful. Um, but at an individual level, we can't um, always see where an individual is, subs is, is substituting. Um, but the theory is you liberalize marijuana by these laws that um, uh, patients, f especially those with, cr with pain, and marijuana is, you know, can be efficacious for many types of pain, particularly neuropathic pain. Uh, I think we'll hear more about that um, later on today. But uh, that, that, you know, the, the patients will use those instead of the opioids and then um, avert these uh, harms and, and deaths. Uh, so, but the 
studies really are that. They're connecting those extremes of the exposure and then the, um, of the policy exposure and then the, the deaths. We need more evidence in the middle there to understand what's happening among the patients. We have some survey data, but it really goes both ways. So some suggest that patients are su just supplementing when they have access to marijuana and adding that on top of opioids, and then some suggest that there is that substitution happening. Um, so, you know, I think in my view, it's, it, although jurisdictions are, I think the cart is ahead of the horse. So a lot of, a lot of jurisdictions, for example, for medical marijuana now, you know, there's qualifying conditions for getting a registration card. And one of, one of them that at least a handful of jurisdictions have adopted now is, um, is opioid replacement therapy is one qualifying condition. So a reason that doctors can, can validate you to get a prescription card. Um, in, and, and I think states are latching on, like New York, that like this is a solution to the opioid crisis. Uh, I think, you know, it, that we need to explore that further. It's promising, maybe, but uh, I think it's maybe a little premature to be jumping on that policy aggressively uh, at this point. I know, I know you have some thoughts here too, Craig, yeah. <laughs> if I could, number one, I uh, just want to let everybody know that we're working with the University of Michigan Injury Center right now, the University of Michigan, to uh, put out an impact study on the effects of marijuana in the state of Michigan. The state of Colorado is four or five years ahead of us on that, and there is some great data and research out there uh, through the Haida National Marijuana Initiative and through the Rocky Mountain Haida about what's been going on in Ohio, or excuse me, in Colorado since uh, they legalized. So there's a lot of great data out there. There's a lot that we can learn in advance of what's going on in Ohio. I can tell you in Michigan, we have 370,000 registered marijuana, medical marijuana card holders, and we have 40,000 caregivers. 92% of the people that have a card in the state of Michigan a report they have chronic pain for their condition. The average age of those people is 28 years of age. Nobody's gonna tell you that, but if you go out to any one of these dispensaries and go look and see what's going on, now, I'm not a scientist, I know it's anecdotal, but nobody is gonna tell me that there's 300,000 28-year-olds suffering from chronic pain, that medical marijuana is the only thing that's gonna help them, considering the science and the evidence isn't there. Let the science and the research get out in front and guide us on that, not, say, the same type of marketing we talked about with prescription drugs, we've seen in the state and in Colorado for marijuana. So let's be science guided, let's be evidence guided, let's let the research make the decision. But unfortunately, we let the genie out of the bottle and now we're gonna have to deal with it. I think as we, as in, in, a, in a conversation that's discussing unintended consequences, there are some things we know from other states with my injury prevention hat on, and, and that's um, in the states that have legalized marijuana, we're seeing a, a large increase in death by motor vehicle crash and driving. And we need to understand what's going on there and exactly what the prevention strategies would be around that. Um, and it's probably a whole separate series of discussions and conversations uh, but there's things we need to understand as we discuss the potential that I think is often raised about marijuana being part of the solution for the opioid crisis. We also need to be asking, in the other hand, at the same time, our, our, what, are we, what should we know or what should we be thinking about, learning about how to prevent potential unintended consequences. One of the things that people need to realize is that a lot of the research and science done on marijuana was done on the marijuana from our days you know, 4%, 5% THC. The marijuana we're growing in the state of Michigan now, plants bud, 28% THC. If you wanna buy shatter, dab, wax, any of those things, what you see the kids vaping, 80 to 100% THC content in those drugs, and nobody has studied that, nobody has any real data on the impact of that level of THC on our children, or on us for that matter. I think we have time for one more question for the audience. Can the panel speak to the limits and potential benefits of real-time surveillance of overdoses, arrests, prescriptions, et cetera? So I, I think I would have, have Craig have, from your vantage point, um, uh, ask you to answer that in how would having um, data that was real time from this week or last week change potential practices on the ground that would differ from the data that you're getting that's 16 or 18 months old? 
for a law enforcement perspective to get data in real time where we are experiencing fatal or non-fatal overdoses in the community will allow law enforcement to, to get assets out there and to identify those traffickers that are providing the fentanyl on the streets and get the fentanyl off, off the streets before more people die. That's the whole basis for the real-time intervention for law enforcement to save lives. If a batch of fentanyl comes into your area and it's highly potent, to know right now that two people died will give us an opportunity to maybe save one life. To know two weeks from now or a month from now that 12 people died doesn't do anything good. On the public health side, time to let the emergency departments know, to get public service announcements out, to let people know that, that, that um, uh, fentanyl can be mixed with cocaine or methamphetamine or it's packaged this way or the purity contents. Any of those ways gives us an opportunity to save a life. Knowing that somebody died in Farmington Hills in 2017 doesn't do me any good. Knowing if I'm the chief of police and I have an app on my phone that uh, we set the parameters um, at uh, two people overdosing and I get that message right now, I can have my investigators out there, I can have the health department out there, I can have the fire department out there and do something right now. Um, do we have time for one more? Yeah, that'd be great. So maybe if each, each, maybe we'll start Rebecca down on your end. And do you want to give any last thoughts for the work that you're, that you've been doing and talked about today and, and where we think this should be going in the future? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I, this has been a fabulous panel um, and mostly about like government policies um, and what we can do. Uh, I think, you know, we just, we need to bear in mind, we need to kind of attack this from all fronts um, and not and not just in government policy, but at a lot of different levels. So, you know, uh, uh, providers, communities, it's gonna be kind of an all hands on deck and, um, you know, this is just one level of intervention. I think, you know, to the mm -hmm. marijuana question before, too, I, I, I know you spent some time thinking about, in, in addition to looking at the multiple layers of opioid policies that are out there now and looking at how those layer on to marijuana policies as they're coming into place and, and thinking about those consequences is going to be a really important area mm -hmm. of future work. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rizzo. I would say, uh, you know, I think it's really important that uh, in addition to addressing the opioid crisis that we take this moment as an opportunity to reflect on what it means for uh, uh, the way we allow industry to disseminate information. I think one of the things that's so striking factually about this when it comes to marketing is that this is not a situation where the risks were unknown. This is not something that happened post-marketing. Suddenly we realized there was a risk from a product that we didn't know fully. We have known what opioids do uh, for centuries. And uh, so it is such an incredible success story in terms of marketing messages. Uh, and to me, it, it should be a wake-up call for a change in the regulatory approach here. When I think about marketing, I can't help but think about the one other part of my life where we spend some time thinking about um, uh, firearm injury in children. And as the country starts thinking about marketing and industry and messaging, it's just in terms of as we think about lessons we've learned in the past in public health and lessons we learn now from the opioid crisis and lessons we'll learn for the next crisis, I, I can't help but think a little I bit about that. Really yeah. Uh, the law of unintended consequences is really important to think about. Um, I remember an initiative we had at the U.S. Attorney's Office where we uh, had a gun buyback program in an effort to get illegal guns off the streets. And it was incredibly successful. Um, someone with a grant came through with uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay for uh, the guns. We bought back hundreds of guns, proclaimed it as a success. And then when we looked at the crime data, we realized that in the days immediately before the buyback, there were hundreds of home invasions <laughs> in the area where people stole guns. Um, and, and so you have to learn from those kinds of things. And so uh, similarly, we have to learn from uh, the kinds of law enforcement uh, initiatives that we're doing and learning from researchers about health data is so important to make sure that uh, when enforcement strategies are implemented, um, that it's being done in a, in a thoughtful way so that um, we can have the intended consequences and not the unintended consequences. It's a fabulous analogy. Yeah. I don't know if I need this, two quick things. Number one, we talk about data and science and evidence. One thing we can't remember is we're talking about mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, sons, friends, neighbors, coworkers that are dying. It's not just numbers. So that's one thing we have to, when you sit on these panels and you sit with a 20-year-old who lost her 18-year-old brother um, to an overdose, 
um, it, it, there's that impact. And the other thing that I, can't, I think we can't forget is, and, and, and rightfully so, we're talking about the people that get to, um, to overdose and, and death through prescription drugs and, and that problem, but we can't forget about that 20 or 25 percent, whatever the number is, that gets there some other way, not through prescription drugs. I mean, 75 percent, whatever the number is, 80 percent, that end up using heroin or fentanyl or overdosing come from prescription drugs, that 20 percent that we, it's a big number. It's a lot of people and it's a lot of lives and we can't forget about those. Yeah, I can't thank the panel enough for all of those last thoughts. So please help me and give them a, a big round of applause. Another incredible panel and thank you. Um, for those that are vegetarian in your, um, in your name badge, you've got one of these cards. If you'd put that in front of you, that'll help the staff um, distribute the food. I want to make sure everybody gets the food that they, they wanted. Um, as uh, I want to also tell you that we're going to be back at 1230 and uh, 1230 sharp. We, we have a really, uh, I think Craig's transition is, is perfect there. We're going to have a, a story of uh, opioid use disorder, heroin and recovery and show that importance of recovery. And then we're gonna have two of our students from our School of Music, Theater, and Dance uh, perform two of the songs from our new musical uh, uh, that's really targeting prevention. And it'll be powerful. Uh, you might wanna stop and get a tissue on the way. Uh, and, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you very much.